this is a very important document, arguably one of the most important documents in our post-war history and certainly in our post-independence history. This is a document that identifies challenges in respect of human rights protection, challenges in respect of the constitutional architecture of the country, as well as with regard to basic governance. As it stands at the present moment, even though the LLRC, a presidentially appointed commission, which the government of this country told us and the rest of the world, will answer all questions and clarify all doubts with regard to human rights violations and issues of accountability, even though that is the case, as previous speakers have noted, it is not yet available to the general public of this country in either or any of the two official languages. The first thing I want to say to you, is that we as civil society should demand as a matter of national priority and the utmost urgency that the entirety of the LLRC report is translated and distributed with a copy in every single public library in this country. That is an absolute necessity so that any citizen of this country who wants to know what's in it will have the opportunity to access it. I say to you that when the resolution in Geneva was being debated and when it was passed, it was the height of cynicism bordering on insult to the citizens of this country that they were asked to come and demonstrate about an issue, the details of which they had no idea because it was not available to them and not there for them to make up their own minds. The very substance, the very basic element of a democracy is, at the end of the day, our ability and our willingness as citizens to be able to make informed choice. In order to do that, we need to have the information at our disposal. And I say to you that those who came out and demonstrated against the implementation of the LLRC and against what was happening in Geneva did not have the information to make an informed choice. Now, a lot of us had reservations about the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. However, a lot of us have nevertheless acknowledged that in some very fundamental respects, the LLRC has come out with recommendations which, unsurprisingly, we in civil society have been championing for at least a decade or more. We need those to be implemented. The key thing I say to you now is that once there must be greater awareness and understanding of the contents of the LLRC report, those of us who have read it also need to frame a national debate around what is important and what should be prioritized in terms of its recommendations. We have to be very careful, and I want to stress this, we have to be very careful that we don't arrive at a situation in which the government of the day says everything that it does is an implementation of LLRC recommendations. Because it covers a wide spectrum of issues. And so every day the President shakes hands with an ex 
LTT Carter, who has been rehabilitated. Or every day, when he makes a speech in Sinhala and intersperses it with a couple of sentences in Tamil, he can get up and say, look, this is all about reconciliation. This is all about El Elasi. But I'm not caricaturing. What I want to stress here is that we need to identify what are the core issues in that report. The core issues in that report which will make an appreciable change and put us on the path to reconciliation. There are symbolic recommendations and there are substantive recommendations. And we need to be very clear that the symbolic recommendations alone are not going to be enough in order to be able to set the country on the path to reconciliation. That's one. Secondly, we need to ask the government as to what the relationship is between the LLRC report its recommendations and the commission or committee that has been set up to decide as to what of the LLRC report should be implemented and the National Human Rights Action Plan. How do the two correspond to each other? What is the relationship when it comes to implementation? Which is to be given priority? How much of the LLRC recommendations are really going to be taken on board into the National Human Rights Action Plan? It's interesting to note that in the National Human Rights Action Plan, there are lots of things that are supposed to be done in which the lead agency in government is the Ministry, yes, yes, of Defence. That is quite ironic. But nevertheless, if that is to be a serious proposition, we in civil society then have to have the wherewithal, the commitment, the diligence to be able to monitor it. So what is the relationship between the National Human Rights Action Plan and the LLRC? The third point I want to make to you, and I want to submit to you, that Reconciliation in this country needs to be carried out within a political framework. The LLRC itself is very, very clear, very clear in saying that the primary responsibility for reconciliation lies with the government of the country. Therefore, the government of the country has a duty a responsibility to initiate, initiate the process by which this political framework will be created. And I think what that fundamentally means is moving towards a political settlement of the ethnic conflict. For too long have we had a farcical situation which is now completely deadlocked with regard to a political settlement of the ethnic conflict. Either the government comes out and says to us, as we approach three years after the military victory, that the military victory is the end of the story, or the government responds to the proposals that the TNA has put on the table, re-engages them in talks, reaches a consensus, and then goes to the parliamentary select committee. We need to see demonstrable progress on the ground with regard to a political settlement. I think that's an absolute necessity. The second one is, I understand that in the last week or couple of days, there was a newspaper advertisement or a circular put out saying that families of detainees will be able to phone three or four telephone numbers to find out where their members of their family are, that only the families of detainees will be allowed to do this. I think there has to be a commitment to a proper register and database which is accessible to the public at large. This is 
an issue which causes tremendous pain and suffering at a private, personal level, and then impacts at the national level as well. There needs to be a proper commitment. The government effectively lied to the TNA and to the families of detainees once those direct talks started in 2010. Thrice they said, three times, they said that they would give lists. People went to government officers in these areas and were denied any lists. There were no lists at all. So I think that's tremendously important that there is demonstrable progress which we as civil society can monitor. Can monitor. We need to have action here in terms of LLRC implementation which we can monitor and show that these things are actually happening. Thirdly, there has to be, and no, no ifs and buts about this, has to be very clear decrease in military presence and involvement in civilian life in the North and East in particular. That is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that the military now is an actor in the economy in particular in the North and East, but not exclusively. It is unacceptable that the leader of the opposition in the Lok Sabha in India can get up and say that people can't have birthday parties in the northern part of this country without the military walking in uninvited. That is totally unacceptable. It is unacceptable too that in a situation where you have one soldier for every eight citizens that you still have disappearances <laughs> and you can still have people daring to fly the tiger flag at a political rally. It is equally unacceptable that nothing has happened with regard to these persons who were supposed to have waved the tiger flag on the 1st of May in Jaffa. So, clear, very, very clear steps which can be monitored with regard to the decrease of militarization in terms of military intervention in civilian and civic life and in the economy. Then I want to submit to you that we also do need legislation with regard to right to information. As has been said before, this is a subject that has been bandied about quite a bit, but it is fundamental, fundamental to all forms of governance and to human rights as well, in particular. I cannot understand as to why the government cannot come out categorically and say whether it is or is not in favor. We know that this is a government that probably has broken Guinness Books of Records with regard to the speed with which it can bring in fundamental legislation affecting, distinguishing, defining the structure of governance in this country. As Larry pointed out, and as we have pointed out many times, how long did it take to draft the 18th Amendment and pass it into law? How long, therefore, will it take to draft a Right to Information Act and pass it into law? We need to demand these things of the government, or else we are going to absolve ourselves, abdicate the responsibility with regard to governance and reconciliation in this country and have to rely at the end of the day upon the international community, whether it be in Geneva or whether it be in Washington. The next point I want to make to you is this, this is that, as most of you know, we are told our Minister of Foreign Affairs will be meeting the U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on the 18th of this month. He's there because an invitation was sent to him much earlier, I think it was at the end of January, to come and talk about implementation of the LLRC. He refused to go then and now has gone. 
I hope that the members of parliament in our midst will demand that there is full disclosure as to what was discussed at those meetings. Is the minister making promises and pledges to a foreign government which he cannot and will not make in public to the citizens of this country? We need to know, is there a plan? Is there no plan? What actually transpired? Because the government keeps using the argument that sovereignty is being encroached upon, infringed upon every time we talk about human rights. But it is the government at the end of the day that allows our sovereignty to be infringed and encroached upon to the extent that it ignores its responsibilities to us as citizens and we have to seek the support and solidarity of the international community to make them come to their senses and understand why they are there in the first place. I've taken up a lot of time, but I want to reiterate and end on is this, is that we need to raise awareness with regard to the LLRC because it has not been available, the report in Singular and Tamil. At the same time, we need to work on framing a national debate with regard to what should be prioritized in that report in terms of implementation. There are symbolic recommendations, there are substantive recommendations, and we need to ensure that there is monitorable, demonstrable progress with regard to those substantive provisions. And key amongst them, I will say to you again, is the whole question of a political settlement, demilitarization in the North and East, the issue of detainees. And one last point, one very last point, and very important one, in terms of what is, what I think are the core fundamental questions, is as the resolution in Geneva pointed out, the LLRC falls short in respect of accountability accountability with regard to war crimes or the allegations of war crimes. At the same time, the LLRC does call for some investigations to open up the investigation with regard to ACF, with regard to the Trincomalee 5, but also with regard to the Channel 4 investigations. And it also concedes that there might have been instances in which civilians were killed where security force personnel could have been responsible. Now we need to ensure that even if the government of this country is unwilling or unable to open up a proper investigation in respect of all allegations, that those identified at least in the LLRC are commenced. There can be no excuse with regard to Trincomalee 5, with regard to the 17 ACF workers. Absolutely no excuse. There needs to be demonstrable action, therefore, with regard to accountability as well. So, let us commit ourselves to putting pressure on the government, who its own commission has said very clearly has the primary responsibility for the process of reconciliation in this country. Thank you.